Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting episode of Secrets to Real Estate Investing. We have with us today a man who is very similar to me in background. It's a little bit eerie. <laughs> so anyway, this gentleman, Tom Caffarella, started out as an accountant, as did I, and now has transitioned to the world of real estate investing. And I'm really excited to have him on the show and share a bit of his journey and his strategies for success. He has taken it to a really advanced level, but he's got some great advice even for the new people starting out. So at that, welcome to the show, Tom Caffarella. Thank you very much for having me on. So glad to have you. And listeners, he is from Boston and I'm here in Southern California. So he's where it's cold. I'm where it's cold, but not as cold. But um, yeah, it's cold to just, me in the 60s. Woo. We were just in between two nor'easters the last two weeks. So you don't have to rub it in right now. <laughs> well, I'm really cold and wearing jackets because, you know, it's 62 degrees today. Mm. Anyway, yeah. But we pay the sunshine tax here. Yes. Anyway, well, Tom, give our listeners a little bit of background about you and your journey into how you got to where you are today. Cool. So um, it really all started when I was in college. Um, I was pre-med and I worked as a pizza delivery boy, um, you know, putting my way through school and all that good stuff. And I did everything I had to do to get into medical school. And while I'm driving around, paying my bills, having my day job, um, I happened to put in an audio book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, into the cassette deck of my car, just kind of killing time. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners have either read it or heard of it. And by the time I got done with that audio book, I knew that I didn't want a traditional career path. I knew I wanted to be in business, whether it was real estate or just growing my own business. And so literally by the time I finished that cassette tape, I said, I've got to change course. I ended up double majoring um, in biochem and accounting. And I did the accounting only because at that time, that was kind of the easiest way to get into the business world. Um, it was right off of Sarbanes-Oxley, which was a, you know, a specific uh, regulation that basically put uh, accountants on the map and you know we were just getting crazy job offers out of school so I said well let me kind of get into accounting to get into the business world in some way shape or form um, and then basically as soon as I showed up you know within the first couple of weeks I knew I wasn't gonna make it um, you know I'm a pretty entrepreneurial person and accounting is probably the least one of the least entrepreneurial professions <laughs> So, you support all the entrepreneurs though, right? It, it, well, that and was I got to tell you too, I was in entrepreneurial services at Ernst & Young. So I was trying to get there, but yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> I thought that basically by doing what, what you just said, by basically serving the people that were entrepreneurs, maybe I'd learn a little bit, but it was nothing like that whatsoever. And, you know, it was my, you know, just misunderstanding of what the profession would be like. And so I ended up spending the first year and a half of my career after I got my CPA license, basically just saying, you know, I've got to learn everything I can about being a business owner. And um, I was reading everything I could about being a real estate investor. And I read the, the book, The 4-Hour Workweek. And The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss is another book that just super motivated me. And he talked about the fact that you don't want to be the, the, the middle-aged person that's driving a red Corvette that hates their job every day. And kind of the meaning behind that is basically somebody that is pretty well off financially, but they're still a slave to their career. And, you know, all they have to show for it is kind of fancy items. And um, shortly after I read that book, um, I actually got fired. So, so I had been- <laughs> And were you happy or sad about it? <laughs> I thought I was the biggest failure. Um, I did. I, I, I thought I was a failure and I thought that by trying to become an entrepreneur, it was very risky. Now, mind you, this is now 11 years ago. I was 24 years old, living in my parents' basement with no bills and no kids. In my head, I was a failure and in my head, I was taking a huge risk. Looking back on it, it was the least risky thing you could possibly do and it was just, you know, it's crazy for me to not do it. But after reading that book, The 4-Hour Work Week, I said, I've got to at least give this a try. And so I kind of fumbled around on my own, trying to get things started, trying to get things off the ground. Your first year or two in business is your hardest because 
you're getting your teeth kicked in, you don't know what to do, you're failing all the time, you don't know if you're ever going to make it, you don't know if you're ever going to get over that hump. And finally, um, after failing a lot, I ended up um, hooking up with a local area real estate mentor. And from there, I don't want to I don't want to say things took off because they weren't it didn't happen immediately, but things started to click. I started doing my first deal and then my first deal turned into my second deal and then all of a sudden I was building a business that, you know, now allows me to do over 100 fix and flips a year, own over 300 rental units and have, you know, a greater than 200 person real estate brokerage. So, um wow. <laughs> Yep. I'm, I'm busy. I'm a workaholic. So, you know, you know, you know, full disclosure, this did not happen by me working four hours a week. This happened with me working 80 to hundred hours a week and loving my business, loving real estate and never feeling like I should take a day off because I love what I do. Wow. Well, tell us about, if you would, your very first deal. Uh, my very first deal was extremely lucky. So my very first deal, um, once I basically started working with that mentor, he said, the first thing you have to do is you have to get face-to-face -face appointments with sellers whose homes are not currently on the market. You need to get off-market deals. So um, at the time, I was spending a little bit of money online um, on Google Pay-Per-Click, and I got this person who filled out a two-family home, wanted to meet with me, went out there, and my numbers, it was a, in a very hot section of Boston, and my numbers told me that I could pay $400,000 for this property. Now, being super scared and conservative, I ended up going out there and I made a $300,000 offer. And when she ever said yes, I, you know, I didn't know what to do. And again, kind of like you alluded to in the beginning, like, you know, that maybe I was happy I got fired. I wasn't. And like most people would think, you'd be happy to get a property for $100,000 less than what your target market should be. I was freaking out. That's because scary. Because that, someone actually said yes. Like, oh crap, now I got a deal. Now I, have a, now I have a deal, but I have no money. I had $5,000 in my bank account at that time. And luckily I had the mentor that I had. And the mentor said to me, look, um, I know you don't have the money for it. If you can't buy it, I will. But you shouldn't sell the property to me because I'm not going to give you the most amount of money for it. You should market it to all of the investors in this area and get as much money as you can and assign the contract, which is what I did. And I had it for such a good price. I had it under contract for 300,000. My goal was to sell it for 350. And I thought in my head, if I can make $50,000 on this assignment deal, you know, that would launch my real estate investing career. I, I promoted it for 350 and it was such a good deal that we ended up having over 200 people show up at that open house. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So long story short, the 350 turned into 415,000. So I made 115,000 on my first deal without ever having to use money or having to rehab the project. Now, <clears throat> the person that bought that deal for me also got a really good deal on it because I was I was selling it wholesale and he ended up making over 300,000 from start to finish. But what, what was the after repaired value on that one? So it's an interesting thing. Um, I don't know how, what part of Southern California are you in? Orange County, so just south of Los Angeles. Okay, so they do condo conversions there, right? Yes. Okay, so this is a really hot area of Boston where there are tons of condo conversions. And basically um, what the person ended up doing, they, they paid 415000 for me and they ended up putting in like two to 300000 into it and selling both condos for a little bit over 500,000 a piece. So the after repair value was a little bit over a million dollars. Wow, what an amazing deal. I wish those were hanging out around here. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I, I went around in the beginning and I made super low offers. And we were also at a point in time, this is going back to the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, where the market was distressed. So in some, in some cases, you know, we, we try to buy on the formula 70% of ARV minus repairs. At sometimes in that market, you could get 50, 55 cents on the dollar. Where yeah. you're located, where I'm located, it's not really a realistic reality in most cases. But anymore. For today, but for it today. was then. Yeah, we but, got stuff at 50 cents on the dollar all the time at auctions back then. Exactly. So it, back then, I mean, you could do it. And, um, you know, it's a different market now. It's got its own challenges and pluses. 
Um, but you know, I got really lucky on my first deal. I got so lucky on my first deal that I didn't do my second deal for a long time because I was still running out and making 50 cent on the dollar offers and I didn't get anything accepted for another six months. So, mm. you know, when I advise people on making offers, some people will say, well, just be super conservative. You'll never go wrong. But the problem is, is that in markets like mine and yours where it's super competitive, if you go around making these super, super low offers, you may never do a deal. That's so, absolutely true. Yes. So we talk about making a Goldilocks offer, which is basically like, you know, you, you can't make an offer too high because you won't make money. And if you make an offer too low, you may never do a deal. So we want to make it a just right offer so that it both gives us enough flexibility to make money, but also will allow us to do deal after deal after deal after deal. I love that analogy, Goldilocks. How cute. Yes. yes. <laughs> Not too high, not too low, but just right. Okay. Yep. Well, cool. Well, um, that's super interesting. And I love when people have an awesome success story for their first deal. Mm -hmm. And it kept you going. Because I have a girlfriend that lost a bunch of money in her first deal. I broke even on our first deal. Yep. So it, you can have all kinds of first deals and you can still end up with success, right? <laughs> I, I think you have a better chance of success when you have a mentor kind of watching out because you know you can lose money too if you have a mentor but it's less likely because if you have somebody especially somebody that you can call and say hey look you know does this make sense we've lost money on a lot of deals so we've seen a lot and i'm sure you've had the same thing happen yeah so it's like you know just being able to text somebody or send them a facebook message or call them and say what do you think about this a lot of times can prevent you from having that bad first deal yeah for sure and in my case, it actually pushed me forward to do that first deal because I may have ended up backing out of that one that I, you know, I made a ton of money on because well, I, I, I needed that push. And I am so happy to hear that he treated you so well yes. and looked out for you because I was just hearing on another podcast a couple of days ago, this guy talking about how his mentor came in and scooped out like... The student came to him and said, oh, I'm thinking of buying this house on 123 Main Street for X dollars. And the mentor went behind his back and went and scooped it up and bought it before he could. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I and I'm like, I can't believe the student kept talking to the mentor. The, the mentor was so unethical and awful. Like, oh, what a jerk. Like, why wouldn't, why would you even stick with him and do deals with him anymore? So there's bad people out there still. So you got to protect yourself. <laughs> there are in every industry. So you do, you always have to be careful no matter what. Yeah. Well, let's get into some of your current strategies and tactics. And I'm especially excited, as I told you before we started to hear about what you're doing with Facebook ads, mm -hmm. because as a realtor, I'm seeing, you know, I'm getting leads as a realtor and my cost per lead is way lower than it is, for instance, with realtor.com. Yep. And I kind of compare that in the real estate investing world of Google pay per click versus mm -hmm. Facebook ads. Cause those are two legitimate ways. Google pay per click in my market in Southern California is very expensive. Like, yeah. What do you guys that like six I, or $700 a lead now? <laughs> probably. No, I've heard of people paying like 100 on up per click. Yeah. It's really oh, no, expensive. I meant per lead per click. Yeah. I, I've heard you, people in your market are paying five, six, $700 per form filled out. I believe that. Yeah. And yeah. I just, have, I'm a scaredy cat of spending that much money and not, you know, it's just so much risk to me compared to my easy for me way, which is networking to find deals. I still love to just talk to people and get deals that way. But for other people who are more introverted or don't have a big network, like you obviously do now, and I do too. Um, tell us about the opportunity with Facebook advertising. So the one thing I want to say about kind of the way that you do things and a little bit differently than the way I do things, just in general, to give your audience some background is, so I, let, I think networking is an unbelievable way to get deals. I've got, you know, some of my best deals that way. The problem I find with, with networking, though, is it's not really scalable. So you only have so many hours in the day, and that's why I'm a big proponent of paid marketing, because if you, if you're, if you run the numbers and you understand the numbers of paid marketing, it's just a matter of you put a dollar in, you get five or six dollars out. And so leads are expensive for sure. It doesn't matter what type of lead source that you're paying for. 
but it's all about what the ROI is. So I know some people in your market are paying five or $600 a lead and they just run the numbers. They say, if I get 20 leads and I spend 10 grand, well, am I gonna make a 50, 60, 70, $80,000 profit in Southern California? And the answer is yes. So um, it's, it's all a numbers game. And so when it comes to marketing, there's really four things that I believe work really well. And people can argue that there are other marketing strategies, but these are the ones that work the best today. Um, Google pay-per-click, Facebook, cold calling, and mailing. And, and those four work really well. They've worked really well for a while. Facebook is the newest out of all of them. Um, Google pay-per-click has been around for 10 plus years. Mailing's been around forever. It's probably the most kind of tried and true method. And cold calling is something that's always worked. Uh, a lot of people don't like doing it. Um, I have um, a team of over 200 real estate agents that will cold call for me and get me face to face with sellers. But I also pay people, I pay third party uh, providers for people that work overseas to cold call for me as well. So you don't necessarily have to be the one cold calling as long as you have the right systems in place. Interesting. Okay. Well, tell us more about the Facebook ads and how you started it, maybe some success stories that you've had with it and what your yeah. advice is on it. So um, Facebook is one of those things. It's, it's an interesting platform because first of all, Facebook knows everything about you, right? Facebook knows everything that you put in about yourself, which is a lot, right? You put in what you like, you put in what you don't like, you put in your age, you put in your, your profession. It knows who your friends are. It knows where you live. But then Facebook is also a data aggregator, which means that Facebook takes all the information that you put in and then it runs it against third party platforms, right? So Facebook doesn't just know, you know, where you live, meaning the city that you put in. It also knows whether or not you're a homeowner, right? Because it's running all of this data against it. And so what that allows someone who's buying Facebook ads to do, it literally allows them to go down and select all of the personality profiles or all of the particular information that they want in order to put ads up in front of the right people. So I know for myself, you know, buying properties, first of all, if I'm on Facebook, I want to target people who own homes. I don't want to put ads up in front of people who don't own homes. But I also know that I want to put ads up in front of people in a certain net worth. I want to put the ads in front of a certain age group, right? I know that there are some, there are some things that are, are more likely to make somebody move versus not move. So I'm making sure that my ads are being seen by the right people at the right time. And now people don't necessarily go on Facebook to sell their home, but the reality is, is we're, we're in Facebook all day long nowadays. There are few far in between people that aren't on Facebook and the people that are on Facebook probably spend more time on Facebook nowadays than they do on any other platform. So people are on Facebook all day long and we're serving up ads in front of them and we're just putting them in front of the right people and we're available when somebody is interested in learning more. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Would you be willing to share some of those, um, like what you think the right net worth and age group is in your area, which I know is different, <clears throat> possibly in different parts of the country too? Yeah, so I mean, there's a few few components to that. The first is like, where where what cities do you want to buy homes in? So in every area of the country, there's going to be certain areas that are more likely to sell to investors than than are not, right? So we want to always look for areas that are a little bit more distressed than average. Those okay. are the type of areas that are more likely to sell to investors. We also want to go into areas where there's a lot of turnover. And you can look at the type of neighborhoods where there's a lot of turnover, where people don't live for 30, 40, 50 years, they live for three or four or five years. And that's typically in a more kind of starter type neighborhood. So first you've got to decide what city, the people you want the ads to be up in front of, but then you also want to put them up in front of the people that are more likely to sell to investors. So we know that on average, older people tend to sell to us, right? So I'm a 35 year old guy. I've never bought I bought over 500 homes. I've never bought a property distressed from somebody my age or younger, right? Because typically they don't, if they bought a home, they didn't buy it that long ago. They're more willing to do repairs. They probably have less equity in their home. So we know we want them to be a little bit older, right? And we know so we want- So what's your definition of older, buddy? <laughs> well, you know, really it depends on how much money you have to spend. So the typical 
that, that people will put on there is about 50 years and older. But I actually personally run them a little bit less than that only because I have a pretty big marketing budget. Now, if you were to say to me, I've got, you know, a smaller marketing budget, I might even go a little bit higher. I might say 55 plus because you want to narrow down a little bit based on the budget that you have. So you've got to put the ads up in front of the people who are more likely to sell to you. And if you put them up, like I said, in front of 20 and 30 year olds, the odds, the probability of somebody clicking on that and then selling to an investor are just so low. That's true. That's true. And, and you can also, by the way, so the other piece of that is who are you going to put the ads up in front of, right? Facebook knows your profession. So you're not going to want to be showing these ads to doctors, to lawyers, to real estate agents in particular, right? So you're able to exclude certain uh, job job features that the people will have, job functions that people will have. Right. Right. And I have to say, when I first was doing a real estate ad for me as a realtor, almost a year ago, I thought, oh, I want to, um, like, I thought, what does it mean when the realtor.com is an interest? I'm like, they're not going to go like a realtor.com page. I didn't understand what that meant was Facebook, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, knows that they probably have realtor.com on their phone, right? And that they're on realtor.com looking for houses, right? There's a bunch, Facebook has They know stuff. <laughs> they know stuff. I'll put, I'll put it to you like that. You know, you can, when you, when you're on uh, the phone with Facebook, like when you're using the Messenger app as a, as a thing, they're allowed to actually record your calls. You're clicking a button that allows you to record your calls. There's a lot of ways that they can get information and they know a lot about you. Right. So Facebook, that's not the problem that Facebook has. Facebook does have enough information to basically put you into certain categories and the great thing about Facebook ads as compared to like the old school way of doing it, like running a TV or a radio ad, when you run a TV or a radio ad, the problem is you're paying for all of the, every single person who's watching that TV show or every single person who's listening to that radio station, right? If they have an audience of 200,000 people, you're, you have to pay to put your ad up in front of 200,000 people, even if only a thousand of those people are the ones that you want to reach. With Facebook, it's the opposite. Facebook says you can literally go point by point by point by point. And out of those 200,000 people, if you only want to reach 2,000, you're only going to pay to reach 2,000. Right. Yeah, I love that. And then when I figured out, oh, the fact that they like Realtor.com means they're shopping for a house. And for me as a realtor, that was a good thing. I'm like, oh, okay, so yeah, I want that. Um, yeah, tell they, even, us they even have one's uh, categories likely to move. Yeah. And maybe Facebook knows that because you're shopping on homedepot.com looking at repair things because you're going to fix up your house. I don't know what they know and don't know. But probably people that are looking up stuff on their computer, Facebook can figure out, you know, what makes you likely to move. <laughs> well, Facebook is also putting in a lot of different things within the program to keep people on there doing other things. Like they're going to have some shopping things on there as well. So... <clears throat> There's going to be a lot more that's going to be tied in to make it even better for advertisers. At the end of the day, Facebook is really an advertiser's dream because of all these things. And oh, yeah. you can't get this information when, you know, again, compared to who's watching TV, right? TV stations have a general idea of who's watching, but Facebook knows down to, you know, how old you are, you know, they know everything. So, yeah. So tell us, do you use the Facebook lead gen um, option or do you how you pull people off Facebook to go to your landing pages? I use Facebook forms, which is I think what you're referring to, which is basically when somebody clicks on the ad, it auto populates the information that they have stored in Facebook, their name, their phone number, and their email address. Mm -hmm. So after they, after that happens, I get their contact information and then they get dropped to my website. And the only reason I, dro I then drop them to my website is because on my website will be additional information that they can enter in about the property, the address and all that good stuff. But my first thing as a marketer that I want is I just want their contact information. So if you drop anybody to a huge form, right, the bigger the form, the longer it takes them to fill it out, the less likely they are to actually do that. So we want to make it as simple as possible. So when they see my ad, it'll say click here to learn more information or click here to get a, a fast cash offer. They'll click on it. Their information will populate. I get it. And then from there, we say, hey, can you do us a favor and let us know the property address and when your time frame is for selling and the condition of your home? 
most of the time they don't fill that information out, which is why we don't ask for it on the first form. Yeah. And do you ask for a phone number on the first form? Phone number, email, and name. Okay. So email is kind of tough nowadays. There's tons of um, spam filters and a lot of people don't reply to email. We've got to get their phone number. Like I would consider eliminating the email field, but I would never consider eliminating the phone field. Interesting. Okay. And can you tell us, do you do pay-per-click ads as well yourself? We do. So the comparison between pay-per-click and Facebook is really simple. Google pay-per-click are going to be higher qualified and more motivated leads because when somebody actually goes to their computer, turns it on, goes into Google and says, sell my house fast, Boston, they are pretty motivated because they took the action themselves. As compared to Facebook, they're on Facebook, they're looking at, you know, their their niece, their nephew, their next door neighbor's dog, and then all of a sudden they see this ad, click here to sell your house fast for cash. So they're gonna be less motivating on average, but the difference in cost is astounding. So we were talking about your market, my market's the same, Boston and Southern California are extremely high cost per lead area. So in my market, for a Google pay-per-click, you might be spending $500 a lead. On Facebook, you can get it down to about 100. So you're basically gonna get five opportunities for the cost of one on Google. The one on Google is gonna be more motivating on average, but I, I would personally rather have five Facebook leads than one Google lead, but it's not, you know, it's something that we could debate because there are pluses and minuses of, of all of these marketing mediums. Yeah, I mean, definitely I've heard Facebook is slower <laughs> to convert. It's a further time horizon. It but has hey. to be, right? Because if they were that motivated, they would have went on Google or they would have, you know, called off that mailer or something, but they're not. They're kind of, you know, a lot of a lot of leads for Facebook, they, they don't turn into deals until six months down the line. But, you know, we are, you know, we're, we're ready, willing, and able to buy them six months later or a year later. And when we go out to the properties, if somebody's thinking about selling in six months, we have no issue putting the property under contract and saying, look, we will close on it in three months or four months or five months. That's interesting. I haven't heard someone with that tactic. That's really clever because <laughs> then you got them committed. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And in some cases in this market, I mean, that can be a huge benefit, right? Five or six or seven months later, sometimes the price is going to be going even further up. They sure are in this um, area. So I imagine they are there too. <laughs> Well, this yeah. is awesome, and I really appreciate you diving so deep into that. And listeners, for our freebie today, Tom is generously going to share with us a screenshot of his most successful Facebook ad. So if you want that, you can grab that um, on my website at hardhatholly.com forward slash 95, or you can text to the number 38470. That's 38470. You're going to text hard hat with no spaces between it. And you can grab that download as well as our past ones. And Tom, let's, um, we're getting here near the end, but I'm going to let you, there's so, we could talk for hours. I'm probably going to have to have you on another show because this is so great. What would you like to talk about for our last few minutes? What advice do you have for people or what would you like to share? Well, I think with ags, just in general, we talked a lot about lead generation. You've got to split test and compare all these different marketing platforms. And even within the marketing platforms like Facebook, you've got to split test the ads that you're going to use. So you alluded to the fact that I'm going to be giving you, you know, my best ad. But the reality is, is that that may or may not work perfectly for you in your market. The cool thing about Facebook, as opposed to like putting up a billboard or running a radio or a TV commercial, is that it's not like you spend all this time, effort, and energy you know, running the, um, the marketing campaign and then you can't change it, right? So if you do a billboard, you might spend two, three, four thousand $4,000 on the artwork and then if it doesn't work, it bombs. The cool thing about Facebook is you can split test. You can compare different pictures and different messages against one another. And really as a marketer, that's one of the things that you always have to consider is that you need to, com you need to compare, right? So even if a mailer is working really well, or even if a script is working well when you're cold calling, you've got to compare it to something else. You've got to make one change, one variable change, right? On the Facebook ad, that might be a picture, right? You have two pictures side by side, you're comparing the two ads, and then you're basically saying, hey, which one won, right? Where am I getting the lower cost per lead? And then you're going to ramp that up. And that's the same thing with cold calling and mailing, right? On mailing, you might decide, I'm going to use one letter that looks like this, and maybe I change the color of the letter, 
or maybe I change what the outside of the envelope looks like, or maybe I compare um, a mailer uh, versus a postcard. And so you've always got to be split testing one versus another. And then in the long, long haul, you really want to scale it out as a business. So, you know, for some of your listeners, they might be in the very beginning stages of, of getting into real estate investing, or they might do, you know, a, a few deals a year, but really over the long haul, you've got to build a team. And so I've, I've built a pretty successful team. My team really covers up all of the gaps that I have. When I first started, I thought that I was really good at everything. And what I figured out really quickly um, by getting my teeth kicked in by the market is that I'm only good at a couple of things and I'm pretty bad at the other things. So building a team that can kind of, you know, cover up your, your weaknesses and make those weaknesses strengths is huge. So I've actually got um, a webinar that your listeners could take a look at at www.buildateamthatbringsyoudeals.com. Again, that's www.buildateamthatbringsyoudeals.com to illustrate exactly how I went from, you know, having no employees, no staff, all the way up to 225 agents that prospect for me on the phone every day. I mentioned that we had a nor'easter in the last couple of weeks. On one of those days, we had a sales contest and the sales contest was who can log the most hours cold calling that day. And I had 40 people competing in that contest. And the person who won called from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So he dialed for 13 straight hours. Wow. And, and he booked six face-to-face -face seller appointments. So that's a, that's a strategy that anybody can use as a real estate investor is cold calling using a mojo dialer type, type system. But over the long haul, like what the way I've done it is I've gotten other people to do some of the prospecting for me so that I'm not the one responsible. Because like I talked about in the beginning, you only have limited amounts of time. So you've got to be able to leverage out your own time and building a team is one way to do that. Well said, what great advice. So that's a glimpse if you're new, starting out, you know, you got to get a few deals or at least one under your belt before you offer 40 people jobs cold calling for you because you also got to figure it out yourself before you can get other people to do it usually. Sometimes you can hire people that know how to do things, right? Yep. But no, I agree. I think you have to at least understand, you know, the basics of it for sure. I mean, um, and that's why in that, in that webinar, it'll show you kind of, it'll outline exactly how I did it. But yeah, you, you can't, you can't hire somebody with no understanding of, of, of how to do the job. You have to have at least a basic understanding. Yeah. Otherwise you don't know if they're doing it right. Nope. Not at <laughs> or all. Or if they're telling you it's not working, then you know why it's not I've working. Had, if I've you had that happen that. many times in the beginning. Oh, this doesn't work. That doesn't work. And then I, I do it myself and I'm like, wait a second. Yeah, no, that actually does work. You just weren't putting in the effort or you didn't yep. know how to do it or, you know, a combination of the two. It works when you work, usually. Yes. <laughs> so cool. Well, thank you so much, Tom. And listeners, that what we're going to have this in the show notes because that's a long URL. Build a team that brings you deals.com. Sweet. Yes. Hey, and what is your Facebook page if people want to check that out of, um, that you run your ads from? So it's just um, Ocean City Development. So you can just go put into Facebook Ocean City Development and you'll, you'll see a bunch of information I have on there. I put a lot of uh, informational con uh, content really for how, to, how people can uh, build a, an investing business. So I do a lot of um, Facebook Lives and stuff like that for people on you know, topics like the topic we're talking about today, which was lead generation. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to having you back in the future and we can talk about other great things. Awesome. Thanks Whenever so much you for your time. Yep. So, thank you so that's um, Tom Caffarella. And so the best, what's the best website for people to check you out besides the download for the webinar or whatever that one was. So your other website. So the other, if you go to my Facebook page, if you just put Facebook, uh, go to Facebook and put in Ocean City Development, there's a bunch of information on there too. Okay. So that's the best way then. Go on Facebook, guys. All right. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Tom. You've been awesome. I appreciate you. And listeners, remember to get our little free download and all the show notes, go to hardhatholly.com forward slash 95 and you'll see all the great details. He gave a lot of good information. So you'll see that, uh, those details in our show notes and get out there and take some action. If you weren't inspired by this, I don't know what would inspire you. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for having me on. 
Hey there, thanks for watching the video. Make sure you like it and click subscribe to get notified of more videos. And you can go to hardhatholly.com for a free download on secrets to finding great deals.